hard on now, given Brexit, etc., to, to sell Scotland, to get through that fog and say, hello, we're here, we want you, when it's your little fancies with a tech firm attached. What's the it is, it is harder, and I think we've, we've particularly seen that in my region, because the, the tradition was really um, EU citizens benefit free movement, they would come and carry out a lot of the, the agricultural seasonal roles, um, which we're now just completely struggling to fill because it's something that someone would want to do for a short while, then move on somewhere else, do something for a short while there. And now they're still doing that, but not in the UK. Um, and that's, that's a real challenge for us. And I think in terms of selling Scotland as a place to come, not being able to tell somebody to apply for a Scottish visa is a big hurdle because people aren't going to be doing that. They're going to be applying for a UK visa. They're going to be going through that system. And I think having a clear, this is your route to Scotland, this is what Scotland has to offer, um, because what we are offering across other sectors is completely different to, to England and Wales in, in many senses. So we are offering something unique, and I think being able to sell that and a route to Scotland specifically would be a big help. Before we go to Hong Kong, Heather, I'd like to ask you maybe for a, an overview of the British situation in terms of, of immigration. You're obviously working in that environment. You're working in London, Westminster, experiencing all the uh, the ups and downs and the, the, the pushes and pulls on, on that. What's your view of, I guess, post-Brexit, where we are on immigration as a United Kingdom? Yeah, I think there's two, two debates going on, really. There's the political debate. Um, which is still, as you said, quite quite polarised, and um, that I think actually polarised within uh, the Conservative Party to a, to a great degree, um, but also to a degree among Labour as well. Meanwhile, the public debate has become much less polarised, and so you have, um, you know, almost half of people in the UK and the majority of people in Scotland now saying that migration has a positive impact um, on the UK. And you have around, uh, I think it's a third of people in Scotland saying um, that migration should be increased. And in the UK as a whole, about 24%, something like that. And when it comes to particular occupations, even more so. So the debate, is, the general debate on migration has become much more positive. Um, and I think that politicians haven't really caught up with that. They're still in the kind of Brexit zone of, you know, People want migration reduced. Um, you know, you often hear politicians talking about pressures on local communities and about you know jobs for British workers, but that is not within the public debate. It's not in the public debate in Scotland. It's not in England. It's not in Wales. And so I think that you have a division uh, between the kind of media and political stance on migration and the general public, which really, if politicians did listen to the public or realise that that change had taken place. It would give them more leeway to introduce policies that would actually be good for the economy. So, you know, we hear a lot about vacancies and in Scotland, job vacancies are higher you know, in the rest of the, the nation, the rest of the country. And um, so I think that's, that's, where, that's what I would say is, is the, the real issue at the moment, a failure, a political failure, a leadership failure to recognise that the public has moved on, and I can go into the reasons why the public has moved on, but that, that's, that's, that's what I think is the, the, the crux of the, the matter. And, and this sense of followership <coughs> rather than leadership is perhaps quite evident in the position being taken by Keir Starmer on immigration. Now he's obviously being he's quite a cautious politician, he is quite anxious to win back the red wall seats and the, the people that voted for Brexit, and is perceiving that as being driven in part by mm -hmm. Immigration and therefore is taking a small c conservative position on that. Do you do you think there is though the scope from what you just said to be a bit bolder and, and, and maybe to lead a bit and, and, and draw public opinion towards a more open climate? Especially what we're seeing from, I suppose, you know, a number of home secretaries at, at Westminster now, where there has been quite a negative view of, of and, and, and rhetoric around immigration and refugees. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the Labour Party seems to still be caught up in the free movement uh, debate. You know, they're having the debate about, you know, should we rejoin, um, which actually the public does no longer talks about that. Um, you know, people's views on Brexit have changed. They don't actually see it as a very positive thing, but neither are they calling for free movement to be introduced. They've kind of moved on from that and think that, you know, there's other, we can, we can increase immigration or we can have immigration <coughs> policies that aren't related, uh, aren't related to that. 
Um, so I, I think I think the Labour Party should be bolder. I think there's a certain amount of caution because they're worried about what people in the red wall seats um, will think, and that they won't then um, vote Labour. But I think you know the, the public uh, respects a party that has has clear policies and actually does what they say say they're going to do. And I think if you look at the reasons why people's attitudes have become more positive, it's really because this, the discussions that people have had since Brexit about the role of migrants in the economy, and particularly during the pandemic, uh, when, migra when migrants were seen as making a big contribution uh, to the key, to key industries. So people kind of realise the necessity of migration in a way that, that politicians are still thinking, oh, do we need them? Do we not, you know, can we do some kind of upskilling? Can, can we, you know, recruit older people back um, into the workforce? Can we do all these things but not recruit migrants? Not really realising that the big controversy and the heat uh, of, uh, around migration has, has been reduced significantly in recent years. Um, so we have Mina and Augustine um, here who are both working, as I said, with, with um, those Hong Kong migrants who have come to Scotland. Um, Mina, you are a Hong Kong migrant. Yourself, would you tell us a bit about your journey to, to Scotland? Hmm. Thank you for the question. So, hello everyone. Hello. Um, I'm Nina. I work with an organisation called UKHK, which is basically a network of churches across the UK supporting people from Hong Kong to settle here. We are also the one of the VSC government funded organisations, so we also make materials, have projects and friendship festivals and all this whatnot with Hong Kong communities across the UK. But for myself, I have to reassure everyone Scottish in the audience as well as on the stage that uh, actually I know Scotland is open to newcomers before I choose Scotland. Because first of all, I studied here previously, so this is a little bit of a cheat. I know Scotland a little bit before, but because I also given much consideration into the Brexit results when I cons when I was considering moving because I sort of also thought that it may be an indicator of how how the people in the land may feel about may feel about outsiders. Yeah. So I must thank you. There is something that I think we know but the question is how to get this message across because uh, I will talk a little bit about my own experience but because actually I think some interesting points have been raised and I don't want to divert it and like, let's say go into my story and just me, 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 me. So I would like to talk a bit about you know, the representation of UK because Scotland is really a little bit like you know being covered in this general idea of Britishness, especially when you consider people from Hong Kong, we typically don't really differentiate England, Welsh, Northern Ireland, and Scotland <laughs> from each other. So if you ask people from Hong Kong what they think about the UK, very often the answer may be very England-centric in this. So you will hear about London, Manchester, Birmingham, all these traditional cities, especially those with an uh, Asian diaspora that you know, that they all know. So sometimes it is indeed difficult to put Scotland out here and talk about how Scotland is attractive. The other <coughs> thing is uh, the anti-migration rhetoric, which I'm actually not really supposed to talk about too much about policies because I'm not very knowledgeable and this is also not my organization stance. So please listen to the rest of this and from me as Mina instead of Mina Ko from UKHK. Actually, Hong Kongers receive their information about the UK from Hong Kong media, mm -hmm. not like essentially UK media, especially if they are still back in Hong Kong. So when you have debates like that, actually, the one trend that I picked up from key opinion leaders on YouTube these days so was actually arguing whether people will have to stay here for eight years before they could start, you know, getting this um, indefinite leave to remain and then move into the citizenship process. As you may all know, that this is still something 
a mere suggestion on the papers. But sometimes people in Hong Kong may already pick up that point because in Hong Kong you also have to understand that the media is not always neutral. We have Paul Beijing media who is very interested in stopping people from Hong Kong to leave and anything anti-immigrants rhetorics will actually be playing to their tones. They will be using a, this as evidence and really talk about it, really try to scare people. So in a way, I'm now probably saying, you know, only addressing the obstacles instead of, you know, what you can do about it. But my feeling is, we understand that Scotland is friendly to us. And that's why you have Hong Kongers here. And lots of them could tell you that. You even have an organization called themselves Scottish Hong Kongers. So we are already wanting to become part of you, not only as a new Scot. So in a way, we look at Scotland's history and culture, and that's something we like, and that's something we want to share. And it's just a matter of let's brainstorm together and see how to get this across. Yeah. And do you find, <coughs> as we build that community, that it becomes easier to persuade others to come? I think we talked the other day about this, and it's the second generation, in a sense, that end up finding it much easier to move. The first generation are the pathfinders, if you like, and, and they have to go through the, the bumps and get over the <coughs> potential you know, idea of prejudice or weather or whatever. But once you're here, you can almost speak back to those who might come and say, it's great or it's fine and, and, and come over. Is that, is that something that you're looking at as someone who's working with Hong Kongers in Scotland? Yeah, and actually, even though the skin have been like in place for probably two years, mm -hmm. we are already seeing a difference. For first year, you actually had people who told us that, you know, we didn't really have friends or family in Scotland. We moved here because that was one very memorial story. I asked a lady, she had been here for like three months before we met each other at a cafe. She told me that she picked Edinburgh and then shipped her husband, her sister, her sister-in-law, as well as the kids here. So a family, quite a big family. Because she looked at the photos of Edinburgh on the website and find it charming. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually quite brave. Quite a courageous thing to yeah, do, yeah. isn't it? For you those of us who prefer Glasgow, that's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Uh, but maybe Glasgow could start, you know, also putting <laughs> pictures. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but but this is how the first wave have been. You know, many of them actually it will be the first time of them to to be in the Scotland as well as to be in UK when they first arrived in Scotland. But this year we are actually looking in at something that I personally call as the second wave because now that the first wave is here, the second wave will usually tell you like, you know, I already know friends and family, someone is in Scotland, they told me that, you know, Edinburgh is like this or my family is already here. We could also tell that, you know, this trend is slightly increasing, probably, you know, maybe not as quick as in London or Manchester, but still increasing because we already knew that there had been new bills in Edinburgh and Glasgow that had been, you know, being brought by people from mm -hmm. Hong Kong. And some were actually already saying like, um, once the building is finished, we will be moving. So they're already buying properties. And if you know the tendency of Hong Kong's pattern of migration is that we are usually a little bit way more prepared. So a lot of mm -hmm. them would actually try to buy the property before even setting foot in the country or even seeing the physical thing. So another courageous thing for us to do. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, So that's why when you hear people from Hong Kong asking other people in Edinburgh and Glasgow to go around and help them to look at the flats, check about, you know, whether there are moles, you know, whether the pies work, it actually means that quite some of them are actually already thinking about here and we're already acting on it. So that has been this trend. And now that we have already some beginning of you know core communities, especially in Edinburgh and Glasgow, you could probably expect that more Hong Kongers would find the idea of moving to Scotland neutral because 
now that they are hearing tales about life in Scotland, they know that their friends, or at least some of them will be here, they know that you know some of their family members will be here, and according to UKHK's research last year, actually whether you have friends or families is a very important decision factor when Hong Kongers you know, considered where in the UK they would want to be moving to. Mm. So this is already a little bit different for, the, for those who are coming right now and from now on, how they make the decision would probably be slightly different from those in the first year or even LOTR visa. So this are it, it does sound a bit like uh, <coughs> Hong Kongers are your sort of ideal immigrants because they're coming and they're determined and quite often they're able to buy property or just plug themselves into the economy. There are all sorts of different levels of immigrants and, and they're all welcome in, in, in different ways. But, you know, there is a sort of, um, I guess, a view of many Hong Kongers that it's, it's come, you know, come and infuse us with your entrepreneurial spirit. I'm, I'm fascinated by this and by what the Minister was saying and where I guess the Scottish Conservative Party sits in this conversation in relation to maybe what we see at, at Westminster. Um, you are you know, an independent thinker on many matters um, and I'm interested on your take on I suppose the, the, the freedom, if I can use that word, of Scotland uh, or, or the input that Scotland might have into immigration decisions or, or the freedom to dictate certain things or whether it's a, a, a separate Scottish visa, whether it's more uh, more uh, formal impact or, or contribution into the MAC decisions that, that, that come. What's, what's your take on it? So, well, first of all, I think it's been a really interesting discussion and, you know, the various in the, the, the conversation about Hong Kong Chinese. I live in Perth with quite a large Hong Kong Chinese population in Perth. In fact, we've got a, a new conservative councillor in Perth who's Hong Kong Chinese, mm -hmm. although he came, his, his parents who came over maybe 40 years ago. So there is a there is a nucleus there already, and I'm sure they... Lots of new Tories. Well, 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 I think on the, on the broader debate, I was looking at some of the, 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 the data around this, which is really interesting. So, so you know, and I mean, actually, Emma, I, I agree with a lot of what Emma said, but I disagreed with some of it. But, you know, so if you look at what's happened since Brexit, you know, contrary to some of the claims that are made, you know, the, the, the level of inward migration to the UK post-Brexit has more than doubled. Now, it has changed in its nature, so EU migration is about the same level it was. A huge growth has been in non-EU migration, so particularly from Asia, uh, India is a big provider of, of, of both work visas and study visas, and Africa, um, Nigeria in particular. Large influxes of, of people from, I suppose, Commonwealth, Commonwealth countries. And so still getting Europeans, but, but, but you know, there's been a, been a big shift. So I think, I, 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 and the other mismatches in, in the rhetoric, and, and you, know, you referred to the, the rhetoric, you know, the, well, I'm not a big fan of the Home Secretary, as you might, might guess, but you know, the Home Secretary's rhetoric on immigration is not matched by what's actually happening. What's actually happening is the UK has probably now got the most liberal immigration policy we've had since the Second World War, if you look at the numbers. So people are people are coming in um, in large numbers and, and you know we have we have a perspective. But I think if you lived if you lived in Kent and you saw people, you know, illegal migrants coming across the channel, you have a particular perspective on that, which skews the debate. And then if you look at look at um, parts of the UK, so out of the 12 regions and nations in the UK, Scotland ranks ninth out of 12 in terms of our ability to, to attract new migrants. So we are the only the only three areas that do worse than us are Wales, Northern Ireland, and the northeast of England. So every other part of England does better than we do. So even even the Brexity parts of England, you know. Which, which people might perceive to be hostile by this are actually doing better at attracting migrants. So I think that's where the key issue becomes. So, so I mean, I've, I've written in the past about having um, this idea of Scotland only visas. I think that's quite interesting. But I'm not sure that actually solves the problem. Because the problem right now is not that UK, UK immigration policy 
is stopping people coming into the UK. The problem is getting people who are coming into the UK to come to Scotland. Um, so while I'm open-minded to you know, a, a, a Scotland visa scheme, it's hard to see how that actually provides a solution to the particular problem we have now. And it's about you know, how do you try and, you know, what we're talking about, about, about cultural issues, how you try and encourage more migrants to see Scotland as a place they want to come and live. And I think that th there's two strands to that. One is opportunity, so it's where people can find jobs, careers, housing. And the second aspect of that is culture. So do people, people, will, I, I would expect, want to come to a place where they will feel culturally at home, perhaps that's somewhere where there's already a settled community uh, that they can link into. And that perhaps is where Scotland needs to do more work to try and ensure that people will feel welcome in a particular community. And one, one final thought, I don't want to hold, hold the conversation, one final thought is, um, so the church we attend in Perth has seen a huge influx in the last two or three years. We have new members from Brazil, from Nigeria, from Zimbabwe, from Mexico. We have a minister who's Brazilian. And, you know, the... the it's a great football team. The, 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 exactly. <laughs> but uh, one of the really interesting things when we had, I mean, 20 years ago, we had this, you know, influx of Polish migration into Scotland, mm -hmm. which, which led to a real revival in, in, in the Catholic Church in Scotland. You know, huge. They swelled the congregations. And I wonder if we're now seeing a revival in, in Protestant churches with, with people from countries like Brazil and Nigeria coming in. That would be really interesting. <laughs> Um, and I suppose the, the thing you touched a bit on there, but didn't go further on, is, is that opportunity and how much uh, in terms of the draw to immigrants is based on the possibility of making a success of, of, yeah. of your life. So setting aside the culture yeah. for the moment, but coming in, getting a job, starting a business, which I think immigrants are very, very good at, is kind of what else would I do yeah. other than, the, the, than start a business? What, what, what are your thoughts on what might be done, I suppose, in, in, in within the limits of the Scottish Government or uh, with, with powers of Westminster to provide a climate where people can actually come here and get cracking quite, quite quickly. I think it's about a, a business friendly environment. I think it's about housing. Housing's a big issue. I and mean, if you look at what happened, you know, going back in the area Emma represents where I, where I grew up, you know, places like Stornoway, you had, you had, you had Asian families moving to Stornoway and opening restaurants and shops. And they went into a community where nobody looked like them. There was nobody from their cultural background. But because they were entrepreneurial and risk-taking, they were prepared to do that. So if you, if you create an economy where, um, which is attractive to people, where they see opportunities, and providing there's, there's good quality housing, good quality schools, of course they'll come. Mm. Well, one of the things that, that occurs to me is that, um, again, that Brexit vote, which was such a seismic uh, moment and had such a seismic impact on our, our country um, that you know a fair chunk of that was driven by people who wouldn't regard themselves as racist and we might not, not regard themselves as racist but people perhaps older people as the, the demographic shows who lived in communities in the north of England or the Midlands for a large part of their lives they were getting on a bit and I remember challenging Tony Blair about this but you know when Britain decided they would allow uh, the, the accession countries to, 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 to uh, immigrate immediately when many other countries put a, a, a time bar on it. Um, so lots of more of them came to Britain because they could. And some of these people were sitting in their communities and then finding that suddenly the communities were full of people from other countries. The names on the shops were changing, the stuff that had been sold in the shops were changing, the language around them was changing. Um, you know, and when you're 20 or 21, you can kind of roll with that, but maybe if you're 70 or 75, that becomes a slightly harder thing to, to deal with. We all become a bit more maybe small C conservative as, as, as we get older. Scotland hasn't really had that because we haven't had mass immigration, and I don't mean <coughs> in any pejorative sense, but even in terms of particular communities in any real way, there are obviously you know, uh, small communities of immigrants around the place, but we, we've kind of absorbed it and it happened at small periods over periods of time, um, but, but Scotland hasn't really had, hasn't been challenged in the way that certain communities in England have been challenged with people arriving en masse, changing perhaps the culture in the sense that certain people would, would struggle with. And is the debate in Scotland, as a, an Italian journalist I met recently said to me, the debate in Scotland about uh, immigration is much more mature 
and I wasn't sure that was the right word because I thought, well, is it? Because actually immigration in Scotland as an issue is you know, less mature than it is in a lot of these communities in England because we haven't experienced it. So it's almost premature that we have this wonderful, positive outlook, you know, bring us your huddled masses, but actually when they do, we might find, as human beings do, that we respond different. Uh, we respond in a way that we've seen that has caused complications elsewhere. Well, I would say, firstly, Scotland has um, is currently home to a significant number of the Ukrainians who have yes. been displaced to the UK. Um, so we are experiencing you know, quite high demand on, on um, particularly Edinburgh and, and Glasgow local authorities, but, but others as well. Um, so I think people are feeling a bit of that. And going back to, to your point around Stornoway, um, I've heard some wonderful stories about um, Syrian refugees who came to the Western Isles and are now winning Gaelic competitions. And it's fantastic. And that that's, um, yes, a few families, but in terms of the, the population of these islands that they're in, in, in the US, South East, it's, it's quite a, a change for the local community. And for that to have worked, I think, was, was a really good success. Um, and why I think it did work in the way that it did is because we had that wraparound support. So people knew they were going to move and that there was going to be something set up for them, that they were matched with housing, that you know that there were others going to the same place, and, and these were the peer support networks that were available to them. And we've, we've learned a lot of lessons there and with Ukraine, because Ukraine's been you know quite easy in a way because it's, it's people from the same nation, who just left in, in similar circumstances. A huge public sympathy for... Huge public sympathy has definitely helped, um, and the support that they need is, is one particular language, um, and we're able to offer that quite easily compared to if it were an influx from many different nations all at once. Um, so yeah, I think perhaps, no, we've not been tested in the same way as others, but where we have been, um, and, and thinking about the, the specific impact that the Syrian refugee resettlement had in places like the Western Isles, it has worked well. Um, I couldn't tell you why exactly, why why Scotland does overall seem to, to welcome refugees and migrants, but I'm confident that if we continue to handle it the right way, continue to show political leadership in wanting Scotland to be welcoming and diverse, then I hope we can keep a hold of that, that attitude. Well, certainly we did a, a, a paper, published a paper about 18 months ago, uh, looking at immigration in terms of Scotland and examining quite often the sub-state immigration across different parts of the world and looking at what had worked and, and what hadn't. And, mm -hmm. and Heather, um, some of it was looking at, well, can a nation like Scotland learn the lessons of countries that have had you know, substantial immigration and have gone through the difficulties that we often find with that substantial immigration, is it possible to get ahead of that? And actually, were we lucky enough or, you know, whatever, to have, you know, a, a sizable portion coming in to fulfil our demographic needs, um, would we be able to avoid or at least <coughs> take the edges of some of the challenges that, that come with immigration? Is that possible or is that just wishful thinking? I think, I think it is possible, I and mean, we refer to kind of rapid change in some people, particularly older people, not liking that change. Uh, some people saw decline in their communities that was happening in any case and linked it to inward migration. So the two weren't really connected. Those areas have become cheaper, gone downhill, um, you know, become areas that, where there was crime rates and that, that kind of thing, and, and, and made that connection. I think now uh, Britain is largely beyond that. A lot of discussions that we had around the time of the referendum, so I did focus groups um, in Kent um, with people about immigration, and the big concern there was about um, people uh, taking it, uh, taking out of the economy before they um, <coughs> paid in, you know, people having sort of access to services that worried about pressure on services, that, that kind of thing, even if actually there wasn't real pressure on services. So there wasn't real pressure on school places, people thought there was. Um, so, um, it, uh, you know, and where those, where those concerns come from, um, you know, it's difficult, it's difficult to say in reality, but I think the thing is for 
some people, the idea of um, free movement meant people coming in, people coming in with all sorts of ulterior motives to commit crime, to pay, to claim benefits. And so I think we've moved on um, from that now, although both in, in Scotland and the rest of the UK, when it comes to people's preferences for an immigration system, they favour one of control rather than numbers. So we hear a lot about numbers at the moment, but actually that's a low priority for most of the public. When asked to choose which would you prefer, a system that exerted control, even if numbers were higher, or one that, where, that, that tried to cut numbers, most people would go for the control option. Um, so on the kind of what could happen in, in Scotland then, what, what you would need to do, I think you would need to ensure, as Emma said, that there was the support network in place that people actually realised, first of all, why are those people coming here? And a bit more about uh, their background. So some research that we <coughs> did um, around Hong Kongers in schools, um, we, we did some case studies of Hong Kong, so all the schools were, were in England. We found um, that actually teachers in schools had no idea why there were quite high numbers of Hong Kongers in their schools. They didn't know about the situation in Hong Kong. and so. They didn't really know much about the needs, the family situation of children from Hong Kong. So if teachers didn't know, you know, how do you expect any, anyone else to know? So you need that kind of level of awareness. And you do also need support networks in place. And you need ways in which uh, migrants and members of the local community can come together, which is why it's so important, the work that Augustine's and Mina's organisations and a lot of other organisations that are supported uh, by the UK government's programme. Um, that's why it's so important, because that kind of face-to-face -face contact normalises migration. And I think what we've seen in, in England, for sure, is that now migration is no longer seen as so controversial as it was, because migrants are settled everywhere. And I think, actually, you have Polish migrants to thank for a lot of this, and this certainly applies in Scotland. And I did some research in Scotland some years ago, and some employers in some of the sort of northern areas around the fishing ports said that some people in those communities in Scotland had never met a migrant before, and that was like gobsmacking to me, but it was true. And just meeting somebody from a, from a different background um, can really change your perceptions to realise, not a criminal, um, you know, they have the same values, you know, and in the case of Hong Kongers, the values are really around family, around wanting a better life for your children. So, so I think social contact, the, the, van, the, the impact of, of social contact can't be underestimated. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. And just just on the, the kind of awareness of why people are, are coming to the community, do you see that as a thing that would always be required? I'm just kind of thinking about, you know, I understand why it's helpful for, for Ukrainians and Syrians and th th there's that sympathy and, and wishing to, to help someone in a difficult situation, but you know, I'm, I'm also thinking about LGBT refugees who might not be able to share why it is that they've left. Um, where where yeah. do you see the line being drawn, I guess? I think in general terms. So, you know, Mina wouldn't have to explain her own particular reasons for coming here. But we know that for Hong Kong, there's a lot of Hong Kong, Hong Kong it's about um, a better life here, escaping the, the political situation mm -hmm. in, in Hong Kong. For Ukrainians, it's really obvious why, yeah. not, why Ukrainians are, are, are coming over here. Um, for other groups, a bit less so. It might be to the education system there, so Nigerians. Um, I'm quite interested, in actually, why Nigerians are the top, top of, the, of the, you know, why such high numbers? Have universities gone up there to recruit? But, you know, the thing is, it's quite a complex picture, but I think, I think the sizable groups, the groups that people are going to come across, so people will come across Hong Kongers, um, particularly in some parts of the UK where they've settled, settled more. And uh, just having that high level of awareness. I mean, I think it's, I wouldn't expect a government awareness program about it, but I would expect it to be part of teacher training, mm -hmm. which I'm quite surprised that, you know, there's no information in the UK, and I don't know whether it's in Scotland, some basic um, information sheets or some email circulation list you might have noticed that, you know, um, some families from Hong Kong are settled, here are the reasons why, here are the things you might want to look out for um, in the same way, and have that kind of awareness that people would have around Ukrainian children arriving. Was that done with Ukrainians or was it largely left if it was complete and obvious that there was a reason they were coming? It's a good question. I, I haven't heard about specific mm -hmm. efforts to explain, but I mean, I, I know that Ukrainian children are, are often telling their classmates what happened. Why, 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 why
yeah, yeah. But but the, the stories I've heard have been uh, uh, all sweeter than you know. <laughs> oh, we, we were invaded. It said, oh well, we, our house wasn't good anymore, so we had to get on a get on a bus. <laughs> I remember uh, I was walking my dog, I live in Stirling, the other day in, a, in the park and there was a basketball court and there was a Ukrainian kid in sort of full, I don't know, it was LA Bulls gear or whatever the team were called and he was just putting it through the legs of all the Scottish kids who were about that size and he was about that size and he was explaining Ukraine to them as he went and it was magical to, to watch. I ended up stopping and listening to him. Just, it's, it's, it's great. Now, 